you for those kind words. At the beginning, I would like to appreciate you all and Dr. Bansi and Diakir Khan for not only putting up this good conference, but also getting me here to discuss uh, about heart failure. I mean, we know that in last two years, or less than one year, two biggest society of the world have released treatment of heart failure guidelines, and we'll touch very important points out of all those which have been pushed forward. I'm sure many of you are aware about so many things, but I'm also sure that by next 15 minutes discussion, we can add something to your knowledge so that you can put into your practice right from tomorrow. So we all know that heart failure is basically signs and symptoms. So there are doctors perhaps who have a myth in their mind that heart failure has to have a relation with ejection fraction. So there is no relation of heart failure to ejection fraction. One can have heart failure at whatever level of ejection fraction, ranging from 5% to 65%. So heart failure basically is signs and symptoms. If you go to the olden days, Framingham criteria for heart failure, pedal edema, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, neck vein distensions, crepitations, cardiomegaly, acute pulmonary edema, tachycardia, pleural effusion. So these are the signs and symptoms. But to make a diagnosis of heart failure more logical, more uniform, and make it more sensitive and specific, few things have been put in last one year. So symptoms and signs of heart failure caused by structural and or functional cardiac abnormality. So there has to be either structure or function of heart going wrong. And that has to be corroborated by at least one additional point. Either a patient should have elevated natriuretic peptide, which is a marker of elevated end diastolic pressure in the ventricle, or patients should have objective evidence that pulmonary or systemic congestion is because of the heart issue. So this is how simplified definition is. And we all know that staging of heart failure, that is stage A, B, C, D, was placed before 15, 12, um, 15 20 years, but now we know it very well. Why staging? Staging gives us a sense that if you do not arrest the process at early stage, then there is a chance that patient will deteriorate and go to the next stage. So it will increase the sensitivity of physicians to treat the patient at a given stage. So stage A and stage B are the patients who never had symptoms of heart failure. Stage A means those patients who are at a high risk of heart failure. So if we can treat those risk factors at that stage, we can prevent heart failure. Say for example, somebody who is hypertensive, no left ventricular hypertrophy, no signs on ECG, no signs on echo, but just mild hypertension. So he or she may not have any symptoms, may not have any structural or functional cardiac abnormality, but he or she is at stage A heart failure. Stage B means you have some structural or functional changes which can be documented by echocardiography or some other test. So say for example, I am hypertensive, I have got left ventricular hypertrophy, so I am stage B heart failure even if I have never symptoms of heart failure in my life. Stage C is something which we commonly see, that is the symptomatic stage of heart failure, and stage D is a sort of advanced or end stage heart failure where you have to think on different lines. Now as I discussed, the heart failure has also been defined based on the signs and ejection fractions we got on echo. So those patients who have got ejection fraction 40% or less, that is generally most of the people appreciate as heart failure. That is called as HEFREF, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. While people who have got 41 to 50% ejection fraction, they are heart failure, mid-range or mildly reduced ejection fraction. And then there are people who have got ejection fraction 50% or more, but still they have got heart failure symptoms and signs. And they have got certain additional evidence on echocardiography, like left ventricular increased mass or LA dilatation, etc. So they are the people who are having heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now these are not strict boundaries. A patient who has got HFREF, ejection fraction 30%, might get treatment and improve to have ejection fraction of 45%. Or vice versa, a patient, he, him you see the ejection fraction of 45% and then somehow because of some reason he may deteriorate ejection fraction and can go to reduce EF. So this is something which is important as far as uh, classification is concerned. Various tests we need to do in a patient with heart failure. Very important point is BNP or anti-pro BNP. So this is less well used by most of the physicians. So that's why I'm stressing this point. Please start using BNP or anti-pro BNP. That not only helps to diagnose heart failure, but also gives you an idea about the gravity of situation and prognosis. Cardiac MRI is another point which has been less used, but it gives you a good idea about certain 
inflammatory storage or inflammatory disease leading to heart failure, as well as it also can give you idea about fibrosis of myocardium, inflammation and edema in the myocardium, some idea about viability of myocardium also. Even based on the need of patients, based on angina or positive stress test, we can do angiography and all these tests ultimately help the patient to get rid of heart failure. So number one, treatment of chronic HFRF. Patients who are NOHA class 2, 3 or 4, ejection fraction less than 40%, we know that there are four important class of treatment. Initially it was ACE inhibitors, which is class 1. Nowadays, since ARNI, which is combination of Valsartan and Secubitril, has a strong data that it improves mortality and recurrent admission much more than ACE inhibitors. So ARNI has replaced as class 1 indication for heart failure. So all the patients who can have access to ARNI should be on ARNI, but then the patients who cannot have access to ARNI can go to ACE inhibitors. Mind well, ARB is not an indication. If a patient is having serious adverse effect with ARNI and ACE inhibitors, that can be either angioedema or very severe cough. That's the only place for ARB. Otherwise, please don't write ARB in patients with HFRF. Cardioselective beta blockers, bisoprolol, metoprolol, succinate sustained release, and carvedilol are the beta blockers. MRS, that is spironolactone, and aplerinone are the approved drugs. We all know that, and this is a conference of diabetes where DAP and MPA are also approved treatment for heart failure. A new molecule which has entered in both of the guidelines is Verisuguat, which has a novel pathway of action. It is basically it is improving the availability of cyclic GMP and AMP in the cell. So this is a drug to be given to patients once you are there with all the four basic pillars of treatment and if patients still develop worsening of heart failure. You might have many patients who are on treatment and then they come to you with breathlessness. You might have to give them a shot of frusemide, lasix or torsemide. Maybe patient gets okay, maybe patient is not okay and you have to get patient admitted. So this is called as worsening heart failure. So there are patients of heart failure who are very stable. You might have seen in your practice, they are having ejection fraction of 30, 35%, and for years together, they are good and fine. On the other side, there are patients who keep deteriorating and keep coming back to you every one, two, three, or four months. That is called as worsening heart failure, and that's where verisugat is a molecule. But mind well, the first and foremost is you have to get the four pillars of the treatment, because four pillars are the drugs which have got superb data to reduce mortality and readmission rate. So ARNI, beta blocker, MR and SGL2 inhibitors. Now there are certain important points as far as these four pillars are concerned. Number one, try to initiate all of them on day one, two or three. Don't wait. Previously it was a story, it was a guideline that you have to first give ACE inhibitors, push up the dose, wait for a few weeks, then start beta blockers, wait for a few weeks. Now that is not the story. The most important reason is all of this drug they start working in terms of reducing mortality, particularly sudden cardiac death, and reducing risk of admission in the first month itself after starting them. So when you start beta blocker, by one month also it has reduced the risk of admission and mortality. When you start ARNI by one month, there is deviation of the curve. So if you delay the initiation of any treatment, you are making a patient devoid of a medicine which has got mortality benefit. So you have to start all of them on day one, two or three. Second point which is proven in various trials is even at a smaller starting dose, they start showing the effects. It's not only that when you push up a dose of bisabloral to 10 milligram per day, then only the effect starts. Even at 1.25 milligram per day dose, the effect starts. Same is with the ARNI. You start at a dose of 50 milligram half twice a day. If you believe that your patient has got borderline blood pressure, creatinine, etc., a very important point to decide about starting all this treatment and pushing that dose is you need to look at the patients very closely in terms of symptoms and signs, blood pressure, heart rate, kidney function, EGFR, and potassium. You all know that these are the parameters by which you keep on building up the dose. You know that there are certain limitations as far as blood pressure is concerned, there are certain limitations as far as potassium is concerned, and there are certain specific contraindications of a given drug also. But if you believe me that if you as a physician is very sensitive that these four drugs, if you start them early, build up the dose to the best possible tolerated, you are cutting down heart failure mortality by 75%. Believe me, this is something which is game changer. What does it mean? If you reduce mortality by 75%, that means you have to treat four patients to reduce one death. This is something amazingly important. So if you're in your practice, in a monthly base, you are getting at least, say, for example, 10 patients of heart failure, you put them on best possible medications, you are going to save three lives. 
So you have got a very easy, a very practical chance to be very effective and influential physicians in the lifestyle of a patient. And that's by building up the dose of these four drugs. Obviously, as I discussed, there are certain contraindications. There are certain points of concerns. You take care of them, but your primary focus has to give the drugs and build up the dose, not not to give the drugs and reduce the dose. Because see, it's all the mindset how which with which a physician thinks. If you're too much afraid of various concerns and side effects, your inner being will tend not to give those medications. And that's where you are doing harm to the patients. So think that how can I build up the dose and then you will be able to do that. Be positive on that terms. Uh, Second point, patients with heart failure, mid-range or mildly reduced ejection fraction. Now these are the patients between 40 to 50. That's where most of the trials have excluded them. All the trials which are done in patients with heart failure, initially if you look to all them, they all had ejection fraction less than 35 and 40%. So practically there are not many trials in which these patients ejection fraction have been included, but you can extrapolate your knowledge and that's why if you look to all these drugs in heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction, the class of recommendation is to be, not one. But still, I personally believe that they are all those patients who are going to get benefit. There is another group of patients which is called as heart failure with improved ejection fraction. A patient was there with you with an ejection fraction of 30%. You kept on giving the treatment. Now patient has ejection fraction of 45%. The question is, should I continue the treatment or should I stop the treatment? Class one recommendation that continue the treatment. Don't stop the treatment because it has been seen that patients with HFREF, they becoming totally reversed to the normal ejection fraction with structurally and functionally normal heart is a rarity is a rarity. Patient may improve their symptoms, patient may improve the structure of heart, the LV dimension may come down, LA dimension may come down, MR and PA pressure may regress, but they never go back to normal heart and that's why they have to be continued all the possible treatment. The third zone, half pef heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Mind well, when ejection fraction is 50% or more, the entire gamut is different. It's not the same half ref like patients. It's basically not a disease of heart. That's where heart is getting affected because of a chronic, strong, systemic inflammation happening in body. So that's where heart is getting victimized. There is not or nothing primarily wrong with the heart. It's something which is systematic. And that's why it's a difficult disease. If somebody asks me the prognosis of HFREF and HFPEF, it is same. If a patient is admitted with ejection fraction of 30% and heart failure versus a patient is admitted with symptoms and signs of heart failure at ejection fraction of 55, both of them will have very poor prognosis. Their five-year mortality is 70%. Unfortunately, HFPEF is not well recognized. And secondly, there are no class one drugs for the HFPEF. So if you have a patient of HFPEF, who is admitted, his or her prognosis is worse than HFREF because there is no treatment for that. Of late, recently some treatment has come. We all know that diuretic, initially you can give to offload the patient of volume of HFPEF, but mind well, if you are overzealous in giving high dose of diuretics, or if you continue diuretics for longer time, they will go to acute kidney injury very fast. So be very careful. SGLT inhibitors is the first drug through both of them. EMPA and DAPA have shown the data that if you give this drug to people with HFPEF, the composite endpoint of admission and mortality is reduced. There are other drugs like ARNI also through Paragon HF has some data that if you give this drug, so patient improves. So generally HFPEF patients would need diuretic in a small dose and then you can stop and curtail. SGLT inhibitors, ARNI, MRS, and if patient is not tolerating ARNI or has no access, you can go to ARB. A very important point, HFPEP patients, you should address other issues like CAD, hypertension, COPD, atrial fibrillation, obesity, anemia, sleep apnea, because they would have most of them with them. If you just keep treating them with these few molecules and do not address to those issues, they will not have any impact on the lifestyle. Now, additional medical therapies, evabradine, Patients, you try to build up the dose of beta blocker to the best possible tolerated dose. Still, if the heart rate is more than 70 in a patient with HFREF, start evabradin, a very good drug. Very sugar, I said that. Build up the four pillars of treatment, but somehow patient worsens, you can start very sugar. Same digoxin, poor man's choice, you can give, but mind well, the dose of digoxin has to be much lower. 0.125 milligram per day, not more than that. Be careful about age and creatinine. PUFA, it keeps on coming and going off, but that is your choice, it is to be. Potassium binders, you know that when you push the dose of ARNI or if ACE inhibitors, many patients do get borderline potassiums of 5.5. Now, should they be 
devoid of the beneficial effects of RAS blockade? The answer is no. You can give them potassium binders, but still the data is borderline. So it's your choice. They are not even so freely available in India. I'll take one, one minute more. Certain drugs to be avoided. Anticoagulation in the absence of genuine indication. Dihydropyridine CCB, diltiazem and verapamil, please never write when patient has heart failure. Please, please never write. Even if it is rheumatic heart disease, I see many patients of rheumatic heart disease, they are on diltiazem and verapamil and they have got heart failure. So be very careful. Nutritional supplements and vitamin supplements, if there is no documented deficiency, nor all, class 1C antiarrhythmics, donodenoron, even uh, uh, your other is this uh, pioglitazone, rosiglitazone, sexagliptins and NSAIDs. NSAIDs are worst drug. Your 50% patients of heart failure are always on NSAID for some days of life or maybe for all days. Ask them only one question, which painkiller do you take? And most of them are taking that. So get rid of them. So coming to sort of conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, heart failure is a complicated disease, devastating disease, and you need to have a comprehensive approach to deal with a patient of heart failure. Treat the cause, maybe CAD, valvular disease, good control of diabetes, blood pressure, Rest when needed, avoid extra exercise, but a very regular exercise training program is a must for heart failure patients, water and salt restrictions, treat the comorbid conditions, give them vaccination for flu and pneumonia as a primary prevention, four pillars of treatment, again and again the most important point. Think of other drugs, devices I didn't discuss because of lack of time, but in, in, in selected patients you can go for devices. And we also know that certain selected patients with mechanical complications, we have options like wall replacement, and various surgeries. Thank you very much for your kind attention.